I think the meme that Arch Linux is difficult to install is always going to circulate around, but if you're unsure about anything, there is countless videos on the topic, whether you want to install with a BIOS-based system, a UEFI-based system, with SystemD boot as your bootloader, with Grub as your bootloader, with some random bootloader that nobody else has ever heard of, there is probably going to be a video on it, and the video is probably going to be one where you can just follow it step by step and get a working system. But even so, some people still struggle, and I think part of this comes from the fact that the Arch Linux ISO is frequently being changed. Not changed as in adding new features, changing the applications that actually come with the ISO. For example, very recently the way you do Wi-Fi completely changed in it. So the suggested method is to follow the installation guide, and I've installed Arch probably, I don't know, three or so times. I don't install Arch for fun, I just do it when I want to set up a new system. But even for me, Following some of the stuff in here can get a little bit confusing, and if you've never installed Arch before, I can see why this would be a bit challenging. So what if there was a more automatic method to do this? And the Arch team thinks this would be cool as well, so they decided to include a new application in the ISO known as Arch Install. Now, what this basically is, is a installation script that will get you to the point where you have basically a working Arch system. Now what this is going to do is go through the installation process without actually requiring you to run any of the individual commands yourself. It's going to do all that for you. You just go and answer the questions it provides you with and then you're left with a working Arch system. At least that's what it's supposed to do, but as we go through this video, I'm going to show you how broken this script is and why it should never have been included in the ISO in the state that it's in. Now, first up, I asked about our keyboard language and provides us with a bunch of things that we could go with. So most people watching this are probably going to be from the US, so you'd select US and be done here. But if you're using a keyboard language that isn't actually in this list, what you can do is press question mark and search for that, or you can search for help, and then you can actually go and search for something. So let's say you want to go and search for, I don't know, we'll search for something on the list, like say, uh, actually we'll just search for E. And this is going to show us everything that has E in its name. And then you're going to be able to select something from this list. But here's the first problem. So let's go back to the search by searching for question mark again. And let's search for something I know isn't in the list, like say, uh, TYU. Sure, that's just something random. It, it crashes. So we have a search bar where you may not necessarily know what you're searching for. And if you search for something that doesn't exist, the application then goes and crashes. That seems like a pretty big problem. And that's not a one-off problem that only occurs with that string. Anything you search for that isn't in the list of languages is going to crash the application every single time. Let's move on to the next step then. So I guess I'll just select US as the language just because I know that works. And this is where it gets into an even weirder part of the application where we have really inconsistent behavior. So let's go and select a region to download the packages from. So with this one, there's not actually a search. Everything you can select is in this list here. So let's go and select something outside of the range. Let's select something like 56, for example and it doesn't stop us. So basically we've selected a region that doesn't exist. Okay, let's go back to that and let's select something that does exist. Let's go and select uh, Australia this time with zero. And what about when we select a disk to actually go and make our partitions with? So let's go and select three, which is outside of the range. Now it crashes. So with the previous one, it didn't crash, but this one it does either crash for everything or don't crash, don't have this weird inconsistent behavior. Honestly, don't do either of those things. Just prompt the user for another value. This happens with basically every single input the application takes. It looks like there was no care in developing this. I don't know why this is included inside of the ISO. So let's move on. Let's select US. Let's go and select Australia as my region. And let's go and select disk one as the one to actually put my petitions on. It's not going to let you select multiple disks. So if you have, say, a root drive you want to use, and then you want to have a separate drive as your home drive, you will have to go and do that manually yourself. This is just going to give you the absolute basic installation. So I'm going to select one this time. And now to select our file system. So everything we've seen so far has been in alphabetical order. This does mean that ButterFS is going to be the top option. 
I think that having this not be alphabetically ordered, but ordered by the recommended file system probably would be better. So that would mean having ext4 at the top, because if you have ButterFS at the top, this may lead people to thinking that ButterFS is the best option to go with. I know there are definitely the proponents of ButterFS, but on Arch, it's still not the recommended file system to go with. Either do that or have some indication of which file system that you should be going with, whether that be a little tag next to it or something like in the selection down the bottom here, just anything that will help. The other thing is that even if ext4 is listed as the recommended file system, you still have no idea what ext4 or butterfs or f2fs actually are. There probably should be some way to bring up some documentation inside of the installer. Okay, so let's just go and select ext4, and then it's going to ask us if we want to do disk encryption, and this is one of the few things that Arch install does really well. So if we go and set a password, it's just automatically going to make disk encryption work, and we don't have to do anything. In my case, I'm not going to, but this is a really compelling feature. So let's just go and press enter. Now it's going to ask us for a host name. I have nothing to complain about here. It sets a host name that's, uh, there's nothing you can really get wrong there. Now, at setting up the root user, it has an interesting suggestion, and that is that if you leave the password blank, it's going to go and disable the root account. Now, I would not recommend doing this because if you go and just have an account with super user privileges, and then you modify your pseudo config and you break your pseudo config, you now cannot do anything with sudo, leaving you in a state where there's basically no way to fix it except, I guess, downloading the ISO and using the root account on that. But just for the fun of it, let's go and follow its recommendation, and then it actually forces us to make an account that does have super user privileges, so it doesn't let us get away with not having those privileges. Which is one of the nice catches it does do, it could very well just let you slip by and make only a user account and have no pseudo privileges on your system at all. Now I'm going to get us back to this point, but actually go and make the root account. Besides showing you that you can go and create additional users, there is something later on that this will actually be helpful for. So I'm going to make a user called Brody, I'm going to set its password, and we're going to make this a pseudo user. And then it's going to prompt us if we want to go and make another one. In my case, I'm just going to press enter and not make any more. Now this is one of the places where it gets kind of useful. So we can go and select one of these profiles and it's gonna go and set up that graphical environment for us so we don't have to do it for ourselves. Some of the options in here are kind of weird though. So first one is awesome, so that'll be awesome WM. I'm gonna skip the second one. Then we go on to GNOME, KDE, KDE Wayland, and then Xorg. Now, Xorg basically just installs Xorg and nothing else on top of it. You have to go and deal with that yourself. Desktop is a weird one. So desktop, what it does is take you to a sub menu, which then lists out the same things that we had before. I don't know why that option is even there. Now, these profiles are just the ones that come with the application, but you can actually go and make your own as well, and I'll talk a bit more about that towards the end of the video. In my case, I'm just going to go and select Awesome, and then it's going to ask us about our graphics drivers. Now, this part needs some obvious improvements. First off, don't have this and read about message here. Include some way to actually look at what the graphics drivers actually are, also, it should try to automatically detect what you're actually using and then say, hey, is this the graphics driver you actually need? If not, you can select something else. I'm just going to go and select the AMD slash ATI, which shouldn't actually be a combined menu. Those should just be separate options. There's no reason to have this sub menu because as we can see, there are separate Mesa and Nvidia options. Those aren't merged together. For the sake of this though, I'm just going to select AMD and then we can select extra applications we want to install alongside the profile. So what happens if we have a spelling mistake in here? So let's say I want to install uh, Vim, but I accidentally put an S on the end. Give it a second. 
it's going to say invalid package name and then quit out of the application. Now for the record, that right there was the last step. So now that we've made a mistake, we have to go and redo the entire installer process all over again. What it should do is say invalid package name, what else do you want to install? Now, there are probably tons of other bugs with this script, but the point of showing the ones that I showed is that all of these are ones you can make by just accidentally pressing the wrong key on your keyboard, and it does nothing to try to recover from it. Every single one of these bugs is a practical class I had in my first semester of university. At least in this last case, there was clearly some error handling actually done, but it didn't have any way to actually recover from it. Okay, I lied about that previous one being the last step, but we were very close to the end. So now it wants us to do some networking. In my case, I'm going to go and select network device one. Now it wants us to select which mode to actually run this network interface in. And it actually tells us what these different modes actually mean, unlike with, say, the file systems. So I'm going to go with DHCP. And now it wants a time zone. But you may notice there's nowhere to search for time zones. And time zones on Linux have to be in a very specific format, so unless you know exactly what your time zone is called, there is no way to select the right option. So I'm just going to go and leave this blank, and now it actually tells us everything we configured, what region we've selected, how big our hard drive is, and if we go and select enter now, it's going to try and start setting stuff up. So firstly, it's going to start doing our petitions. And after this is done, it's going to go and actually start downloading stuff. So as we can see, we're downloading base, base devel, Linux, Linux firmware, EFI boot manager, and nano. Now, why it includes nano? I don't know. That's what the profile has, but you may notice something there. So this has EFI boot manager. I didn't mention this earlier because the script doesn't mention this either, but this only works with UEFI. So if you're running a BIOS system, it doesn't stop you from actually using the script. It could very easily do that by just doing the check for an EFI system. And then if it fails the check, just not running the script, but not in this case, it just lets you install a broken setup. There is one other problem this has. So you might notice it's not actually showing us the Pac-Man output. So we have no idea if this is frozen, if it's actually working, what's actually happening. We just have to wait and assume that it's going to work. It could very easily just show the Pac-Man output. I don't know why it's not. Okay, it is still working. So now we're going and downloading the Xorg server, Xorg Xenit, and also our GPU drivers. Off camera to finish the setup without any errors. So let's see what it's actually done to my system. Let's go and run LSBLK to see how it's set up our petitions. What is this? So SDA is where I actually install my petitions to. So we have two, two petitions. We have the boot petition and we have a root petition. Where's my swap? Where's my home petition? who installs Arch like this? If you're installing Arch like this, you are asking your system to break because if you have some major problem with your root petition, now you're going to lose all of your user data as well. There is one other problem though. So let's go and CD and then CD into home. If we do an LS-A, there's nothing in here. So it didn't actually go and make a user folder either. Like, that's not a big deal, it's easy enough to fix, but if we're going to have this automatic installer, why isn't it doing that? So I'm going to say, as of April 2021, even if you know exactly what you're doing with Arch Linux, just don't even bother with the Arch install script, because it's not going to give you a decently set up system anyway, and especially if you're a new Arch user, definitely don't do this, because you're going to run into problems that you are going to be laughed at for because of this script. Now, I'm very much not of the camp that Arch should be something hard to install. I really, really like the idea of an automated Arch installer, whether that be for a new user who has no idea what they're doing, or a power user who just wants to have their system working in five minutes rather than in 20 minutes. I think this is a really good idea, and the Arch-based distros that do this and do it well, I think are great. This, on the other hand, 
is a really bad implementation. Now over on the GitHub for this, there is an example of how to actually use this as a Python library to script your own installation because yes, you could go and make your own POSIX shell script to distribute your dot files and you should even give it some fancy name and a weird logo, but to be honest, I'm too lazy for that, and if someone wants to go and make all of the hard stuff for me, and then I just input the data that I want to use, I think that's a much better way for me to handle this, and for a lot of other people, is probably going to be the case as well. And even without reading the documentation for these function calls, it's pretty easy to work out basically what's happening in this script. In the future, if the guided installer does improve, I will do another video on it, but for now, Honestly, I think it's not worth your time. So I think that's pretty much everything for me. But before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Joachim, Donald, Michael, Andrew, Nathan, David, Will, Brennan, Chico Bento, Jamie, Joseph, Mitchell, Peter, D, Stephen, Tony, Tushar, and all of my $2 supporters. If you'd like to go support my work, the link's down below to my Patreon, subscribe, sub, leave pay, all that sort of stuff. I've got my podcast, Tech Over T, available basically anywhere and then this channel is available on odyssey and bitshoot if you like to watch it on a platform that isn't youtube so i think that's pretty much everything for me and i'm out <laughs>